Did John Calvin say anything new besides what Augustine said? Did he say anything original at all? Or is New Calvinism, which derives its theology from Calvin, really better called New Augustinianism? Do we know? Can we know? Do we care? Either way, we'll find out. So, Michael Allen, who's professor of systematic theology at Reformed Theological Seminary, very brilliant and emerging scholar. I believe we had the same PhD advisor, uh, you know, within the world of conservative reformed evangelicalism. Very bright guy working on, working on this whole movement of reformed Catholicity and such. And Allen um, has made a point recently, and I, I've seen several of these reformed Catholicity oriented type scholars making points similar to this. Um, he, Alan has made a point recently that has become a uh, popular more in academic reform circles to say that John Calvin's theology wasn't really all that original and that he was simply reappropriating Augustine, uh, the fifth century, fourth, fifth century Bishop for his time. Calvin was reappropriating Augustine for his time. And that's called certain doctrines Calvinist was really a misnomer because we would, we should rather be calling these doctrines that we call Calvinist doctrines. Well, we should really just be called be calling them Augustinian doctrines because Calvin was just reappropriating and reformulating the same things that Augustine was talking about in the same, maybe not in the exact same way. I don't think Alan would say that, but it's more properly called Augustinian. So, uh, you know, Alan raises the question about whether Calvinism ought to be really abandoned as a theological term. For the sake of accuracy, since with regard to the distinctives of so-called Calvinism, you know, well, I'll just tell you how Allen states it. Allen says that Calvin, this is a quote from Michael Allen, quote, Calvin is both unoriginal and not all that definitive, end quote. So in Allen's view, Calvin neither initiated uh, well, he, he, well, Alan, again, let me just use a quote from him. Alan says that Calvin initiated, quote, some belief or instituted some practice, end quote. Nor did he definitively, quote, shape or nor definitively shape the development of some movement, belief or practice. So Alan finally, just to start for this litany of quotes, but Alan argues that even with, quote, regard to the doctrine of predestination, John Calvin affirms the doctrine in the same fashion as Augustine of Hippo a millennium earlier. So, the, and this question is, would it be more accurate, or should we simply, instead of saying, well, it's the new Calvinism, would it be more accurate to say, well, this movement with a redoubling emphasis on human depravity, the, or, or, or really the... Uh, the, the maximized conception of, of human depravity and the maximized conception of meticulous providence and divine sovereignty, is that better called New Augustinianism rather than New Calvinism, right? And as we've just sort of noted, you know, Alan suggests that the term Calvinism ought to be dispensed with entirely because of, his, because of Calvin's utter dependence on Augustine. So, does New Calvinism truly express the spirit of Calvin you know, or Reformed theology anyway, or does it merely channel the spirit of Augustine through Calvin's recapitulation of Augustine's teaching on the divine will and on the human will? Did Calvin say anything original at all? And if he did, was it that original thing that he said by which New Calvinism identifies itself as distinctively Reformed? So, we must decide whether it is sufficient to say of Calvin's ideas that, you, or basically whether it's sufficient to say of Calvin's ideas what Thomas Davis says of the doctrine of predestination in the Christian tradition. And Thomas Davis says this, Predestina or, quote, predestination had a long history as a doctrine within the Christian tradition long before the early Protestants came along. They found Augustine persuasive on this point, end quote. And so, so that's, I just say that, I highlight that quote from Davis just to sort of highlight this, this notion among academics where they see New Calvinism coming on and they're like, stupid, New Calvinism, it's just Augustinianism, repackaged. If they only read, do you even Augustine, bro? That kind of sort of attitude among academics where they look at New Calvinism as just kind of like not smart enough, not, not well read enough, this sort of fetish for the patristics. So, so since the definition... 
options um, on the table for us with regard to, and we're just going to sort of set this up. It's very debatable, but we're just going to set this up as the definite. We're going to sort of define new Calvinism as a heavy emphasis on yada yeah. Of course, you've got emphasis on scripture of all that kind of stuff. But what are the really what are the real theological distinctions of new Calvinism, even within evangelicalism? What distinguishes new Calvinism? And I would say that it's an emphasis on the meticulous providence of God expressed as total sovereignty and the, and, and, and the exhaustive uh, moral corruption of human nature expressed as total depravity. And in light of this, we will examine what both Augustine and Calvin taught on the relationship between the divine will and the human will in order to sort of elucidate whether Calvin had anything original to say about the matter. And if he did, well, then New Calvinism's use of the term Calvinism to apply to the self and even its conception of itself as reformed is justified not only because it has clear precedent in popular culture, which it does, um, Time Magazine, New York Times Magazine, when they talk about Calvinism or New Calvinism, they're talking about an emphasis on total depravity and, and, and uh, divine election and things like that. So, so the new Calvin, Calvinism self-appropriation of the term Calvinism is justified not only because it has clear precedent in popular culture, but also because of its correct identification with its historical figurehead, i.e. John Calvin. So first we're going to look at Augustine's views, then Calvin's views, then sort of concatenate our uh, uh, reflection on those. So Augustine's doctrines of divine providence and human freedom have, have created a maelstrom in modern scholarship, okay? So it is far from obvious what was Augustine's position on these doctrines, and this will become salient to our point below. But the, the primary difficulty, well, it's, it's going to become salient because the, this, this, um, this, this ambiguity about Augustine's belief doesn't, believe, doesn't really exist in Calvin's scholarship about Calvin, but, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So, so the primary difficulty in determining Augustine's view, what is Augustine's view on divine providence and human will, right? So, so the primary difficulty in determining his view must take into account three realities. First, Augustine's writings on human freedom. Second, his writings on providence. And then third, his, uh, his ambiguity in his retractions, which he makes later in his life, right? Where he sort of ex tries to explain some of his ch changes in theology, tries to sort of smooth over things that have changed, things that have stayed the same, which have really solved some problems in Augustine's studies and, and created others. So first, Augustine wrote so strongly in favor of the view that humans have libertarian free will in the beginning of his career as a theologian in his work De Libero Arbitrio, henceforth, we'll, we'll just call it DLA, that this work, Augustine's original work on the human will, was actually later used by Pelagians to justify their own theology. Okay, so he had a very strong doctrine of libertarian free will, which reformers, you know, new Calvinists today would probably call an Arminian view of the will. Okay, and his purpose in arguing so strongly for libertarian freedom was to critique the Manichaean theodicy, which purports that evil in the world emanates from a principle in the divine which is actually very similar to a, a, a Piperian view, a, a Piperian solution to the problem of evil. So Augustine was originally responding to something very much like that, that all the evil in the world emanates from some principle within divinity, which explains how it's actually good in a way that we can't understand. Okay, So in order to defend the holiness of God, Augustine relocates the blame for evil in the world upon the human will rather than on the divine will. Okay, So in DLA, you know, where he writes about libertarian free will in his earlier career, the strongest claim Augustine makes about the divine will is that God, this is the strongest claim that Augustine makes about God's will, okay, is, is that God foreknows what humans will freely choose, which was later known as Molinism, okay? But, but this does not determine freedom's libertarian nature. So Augustine writes this, in DLA. He writes, unless I am mistaken, so sorry, this is a quote from Augustine, quote, unless I am mistaken, you do not force someone to sin just because you foreknow that he is going to sin. Nevertheless, you know, scholars have insisted, um, scholars like uh, Simon Harrison, who's a, who, who is a, a, a theological scholar who, who specializes in Augustine's view of the will, he, he writes, quote, Pelagium is, to an important extent, Augustine's creation, end quote. More than that, Peter Brown, uh, emeritus professor of history at Princeton University, specializing in Augustine, he comments that early Augustine is, quote, on paper, more Pelagian than Pelagius, 
end quote. Okay, so anyone who says, "Oh, Augustine, he was like more Calvin than or more Calvinist than Calvin," it's like, well, hold on for a second. Just hold on a second, okay? Because let's admit that, like, you know, we've got we've got a guy who was so gung ho about libertarian free will at the beginning of his career. Uh, in his sort of uh, conversion from Manichaeism, that his writings were actually being used to justify a view that he later try- spent the rest of his life trying to to debunk and write against the Pelagianism, right? Which is the view that you're you are um, justified in the last day on the basis of your works, and that you 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 uh, your moral power for sanctifying yourself comes from within. Um, you know in 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 compact with divine grace but mainly but 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 is not but is ultimately reliant on yourself and that you can lose your salvation yada 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 okay so that's the first point augustine wrote strongly in favor of the view that humans have libertarian free will in the beginning of his career as a theologian okay in dla second augustine in his later career develops such a strong doctrine of providence that many question whether he recants or or at the very least contradicts his earlier writings and so many people are just so in love with augustine they say oh, how could you say augustine contradicts himself he's a father of the church he's saint augustine actually listen augustine's just a dude and if me and him were here right now it'd be like talking to any other dude okay so we have to remember yeah this guy might have thought a lot about things but he is very messy because he began writing so much so early and and everything there, there really is no way of drawing a full circle around everything augustine said and put and put put that together uh, as a coherent theology you really have to choose between early augustine and late augustine and then there are problems that come with each one okay so so in order to combat the pelagianism which augustine in some sense aided and caused by his earlier writings Augustine begins writing polemically against this notion that one can, by the freedom of one's will, choose to believe in God with no aid from divine grace and sanctify themselves morally in order to be approved by God, all that kind of stuff, right? So in order to do this, he develops a theology that, to use sort of a relevant anachronism, sounds more like Calvin than early Augustine, okay? So early Augustine might have sounded more like Arminius, now he's sounding more like Calvin in his later life, even though, of course, that's an anachronism, right? And that which is simply to say, a heavier emphasis on the sinfulness of human nature and on the uh, uh, on divine control, okay? So, uh, there's a scholar named Albert Newman who was writing over a century ago, but Albert Newman is one of the fa- founders of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He explains uh, Augustine's development as a turning point. So, Augustine's autobiographical development from an emphasis on libertarian free will to an emphasis on divine control, okay? This throughout his life, this theological shift he experiences. Albert Newman explains this development in Augustine's thought as a turning point of the polemical turret from one extreme to the other. So Newman says, quote, the fact that in the anti-Manichaean time, he went too far in maintaining the absolute freedom of the will and the impossibility of sin apart from the personal will and the sinner, while in the anti-Pelagian time, he had ventured too near to the fatalism that he so earnestly combated in the Manichaeans. A v- end quote, a very, very astute and well-written summary of the autobiographical transition uh, uh, um, which Augustine underwent in his life theologically for which many people who utilize Augustine or appeal to Augustine or talk about quote-unquote Augustinian theology really fail to take into account, okay? So, in reading the relevant Augustinian texts, there is a definite uh, polemical purpose motivating his argumentation and some scholars um i take a, a softer read of later augustine some who have an interest in maintaining the truthfulness of augustine and yet may disagree with the sort of the resonances that he has with calvin who comes later of course so some scholars take a softer read of the later augustine right the the the, the anti-pelagian augustine uh for example so so, Gerald Bonner reads Augustine as a compatibilist rather than a fatalist, while another scholar named John Rist, I think in his dissertation, takes Augustine to, to retain a notion of libertarian freedom, which is not compatibilist, right? So, so, so Bonner reads him as, having, uh, as being a compatibilist, right, which is that all is determined, yet we're still morally responsible, yet John Rist takes later Augustine to retain a notion of libertarian freedom. 
but only with reference to humans in a prelapsarian state, which they then lose after the fall. Okay? So, then scholars come in, Ian McFarland and Christopher Kerwan, and they read Augustine as a compatibilist in his later writings, but note his clear affiliation for his former articulations about libertarian free will to the extent that they suspect that consistency never came to fruition in his later writings. So they thought, well, okay, maybe if Augustine lived another 20 years, he finally would have said, okay, here's the final book, here's where I was right, here's where I was wrong, but that, that consistency which could have come from Augustine never came to fruition, and so that we can never really properly refer to a coherent Augustinian theology, okay? So, so, so they say that that Augustine never really uh, left behind his 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 um, his affiliation for his former articulations to the you know to the so that he never really was able to attain that sort of consistency. He kind of waffled in the middle, especially even in his retractions. So, uh, determining what exactly later Augustine believed requires taking into account this third point, right? Because so we've taken into account his writings on human will, his writings on divine will. Now, and that's earlier Augustine, and then later Augustine, and then now uh, third Augustine in his um, his retractions. Okay, so where he has the opportunity to recant his earlier writings, or you know, he does not recant them really, but only says he wished he had articulated it better. But we can kind of read under the lines. It's like wink, nod. Okay, right, Augustine, you're not recanting, but. You sort of are. So, so Augustine clarifies in Retractions that what he wrote in DLA was about human nature. That man by nature makes decisions by his libertarian freedom, which God foreknows, and yet in his fallen state, and here we hear sort of what John Riss was talking about, right? Yet in his fallen state, man is unable to do the good except by divine grace. So Augustine originally wrote in DLA against the Manichaean belief that evil in the world proceeded from the principle of divinity, arguing that instead evil proceeds from man's libertarian choice. Yet in arguing so strongly for libertarian freedom, Augustine had to qualify his writings with a critique of Pelagianism. So, so Augustine writes in his retractions, Augustine writes in his retractions, quote, Unless this human will, then, is freed by the grace of God from the servitude by which it has made him a servant of sin, and unless it is aided to overcome its vices, mortal men cannot live rightly and devoutly, end quote. So, in this statement, we have a clear refutation of the notion of pure libertarian will. But again, that pushes this slider back on the sliding scale uh, closer to the problems that come along with emphasizing divine will over human will, which tend to be more theodicy problems. So, when you push the slider on the sliding scale closer to an emphasis on the human will, well, then you come up with soteriological problems about the relationship between faith and works, which are clearly contradicted in the Apostle Paul, you know, which is the heresy of Pelagianism. And then... Uh, if you push it closer to, um, if you push the slider on the sliding scale closer to the emphasis on divine control in the world and divine will operating in the world, well, then you have some of the philosophical problems that come along with pushing the slider all the way to that end of the scale on Manichaeism, which is really the problem of evil. If God controls everything, how do you justify the holiness of God with that, without saying that evil emanates from a principle within the divine? So... Augustine then strongly introduces deterministic elements in his later writings into his philosophy. And he writes, for instance, on the relationship between moral, cop uh, moral culpability and natural causality. Augustine writes, quote, there is no blame involved when nature and necessity determine an action, end quote. However, most who espouse libertarian free will would not disagree with the notion that libertarian freedom is delimited is sort of delimited by nature and necessity to some degree, right? right? Otherwise, we'd all be like Dr. Manhattan from The Watchmen, okay? But Augustine then says of God, he says, quote, We have obtained our lot, predestined according to the plan of him who accomplishes all things. He then who accomplishes all things brings it about that we begin to believe. Okay, let me read that again. So Augustine then says of God, quote, We have obtained our lot, predestined according to the plan of him who accomplishes all things, qui universa operatur. Then he who accomplishes all things brings it about that we begin to believe, credere incipiamus operatur. End quote. Okay, so this may be the statement in Augustine closest to what one might read in John Calvin. Okay, 
and and in this turn this term incipiamus okay this term incipiamus which is is very key because it marks that god does not directly accomplish the faith in an unqualified way god doesn't perform the act of faith in augustine's um in augustine's account um so god doesn't believe in himself for our sake and that count that as our faith but but god accomplishes the inception of our faith okay so also the term operator right from op operor to work is important one could easily translate qui uni universa operator as who is concerned with all things or the whole phrase could be translated as he who brings about all things brings about the beginning of our salvation so either way here however we render it whichever side of the fence we sort of push this translation through our rendering of the latin one sees in augustine here a clear emphasis on god as the efficient cause of salvation which comes into tension with his writings in dla about libertarian freedom nevertheless when he takes the opportunity in retractions to explain the doctrine of divine providence to common christians he resorts to the weaker language of foreknowledge that he used originally in dla so he says this this is augustine speaking quote whether you run or whether you sleep, you will be what he who cannot be deceived has foreknown that you will be. So, end quote. So, Peter King, who's an Augustine scholar, he argues that, quote, Augustine's substantive thesis across both DLA and retractions is that good works always involve God's gracious assistance in a way that fully preserves human responsibility, end quote. And you notice here how all of the explanations of Augustine that we're finding are just continually unsatisfying, continually unsatisfying because they linger in, uh, in ambiguity, they remain in ambiguity. And whether or not this is in, tr in fact true, requires more rigorous analysis. So there are three questions then on the table, which will help to sift through modern scholarship to determine what Augustine's beliefs were about divine providence and human freedom, okay? Number one, is there a unitary reading that can encompass all of Augustine's writings that either makes sense of Augustine or makes sense at all, <laughs> okay? Number two, should Augustine be read as having developed theologically so as to justify a substantive theological distinction between earlier Augustine and later Augustine, which we've kind of been uh, uh, pre presuming here in our analysis, okay? So is there a unitary reading that can encompass all of Augustine's writings that makes sense of Augustine? Two, should we make a substantive distinction between early Augustine and later Augustine, and should that operate for us in our understanding of so, quote-unquote Augustinian theology? Number three, can Augustine be trusted to interpret his own writings in light of his heavily polemical reasons for writing throughout his career? So Augustine has a stake in thinking of himself as a consistent theologian. Should we trust that? In, should we trust Augustine that he's consistent? Those are three questions that we have to ask about the unit. Is there a unitary reading? Is there a meaningful distinction between early and later Augustine? Can Augustine be trusted to interpret his own writings, right? So later when he's writing in retractions and he's saying, well, when I was writing DLA and I was writing about libertarian free will, what I really meant was, really, Augustine? Really? Really? Okay, well, answering the first question in the affirmative, okay? Is there a unitary reading of Augustine? So, so Eleanor Stump comes in and says, yes, there is a unitary reading of Augustine, okay? And this is what Stump says. So Stump says, uh, uh, so Stump claims that Augustine holds to what she calls a modified libertarianism, which others have classified as compatibilist. Okay, so others will read it or skew or or construe that 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 um, that Augustinian relationship, understanding of the relationship between the divine will and human will as compatibilist. Uh, um, Stump here construes it as a modified libertarianism. Okay, so Stump explains that in Augustine's theology, quote, a person can have libertarian freedom even if God determines her will, provided only that it is up to her whether or not God acts on her will, so that her own intellect and will are the first and ultimate determiner of the final state of her will, end quote. But Stump concludes, quote, 
I don't see how Augustine can suppose that his view of the will and the Pelagian controversy is already contained in his De, De Libero Arbitrio, the DLA. On the contrary, unless Augustine is willing to accept that God's giving of grace is responsive to something in human beings, even if that something is not good or worthy of merit, I don't see how he can be saved from the imputation of theological determinism, read fatalism, with all its infectious consequences. And she's talking about moving the slider and the scale into Manichaeism, right? And end quote from Stump. So Stump, um, therefore, and Stump's a brilliant theologian. Stump, therefore, proposes a prospective unitary reading of Augustine in which later Augustine is read through the lens of earlier Augustine right where she's saying yeah augustine I, and she's kind of answer, answering the third question there a little bit too right that augustine gets wrong his original writings um and in stump's view then augustine resorted in the pelagian controversy which is what he was running into in his later life he resorted in the pelagian controversy to a refutative strategy that contained elements of determinism the extent to which they undermined his earlier writings against manichaeans that he did not himself fully comprehend. And in Stump's view, should Augustine have compromised libertarianism entirely, then the Manichaean theodicy is, the way she puts it, it's, is, the Manichaean theodicy becomes insoluble for Augustine to the extent that he becomes a full Calvinist, anachronistically speaking. Okay, And in answering the first question in the affirmative, is there a unitary reading of Augustine? In answering that in the affirmative, Stump answers the third question in the negative. Okay, yes, August, there's a unitary reading of Augustine, which makes sense. And that unitary reading is that he was inconsistent, which is a no to our third question, right? Augustine was correct about libertarianism all along, Stump argues, and he either did not realize it or he was too timid to admit so brash a departure from his critique of Manichaeism, okay? He didn't really want to admit that he had become so inconsistent because it's like, well, if you're inconsistent... Are you being inconsistent now? Right. So, so, so Augustine wanted, for some reason, to maintain a, 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 a mirage of cohesion in his theology, which couldn't be maintained. But that doesn't take away from the the truthfulness of his earlier writings. Stump argues. Okay. So, James Wetzel, who is begins to write into this conversation as well, he answers. The first question in the affirmative, yes, there is a unitary reading of Augustine, but but toward a modified compatibilism rather than the libertarianism that Stump proposes, okay? So Wetzel's basic, basic argument is that for Augustine, where those who have free will are limited by themselves in the world, right? Nat natural determinants, right? I can't, I'm not Superman, right? I can't fly out my window, right? So there's some natural determinants, but that's not a, phys uh, that's not a philosophical argument against libertarian and free will per se, right? So, so Wetzel's basic argument is that for Augustine, um, where, where those who have free will are limited by themselves in the world, natural determinants, to evil, God is passive. Whereas the discrete possibility of faith requires an active and discrete supernatural determinant, which we call effectual calling, to open the door to faith's possibility, okay? Nevertheless, in Wetzel's reading for Augustine, in order for human freedom to remain real, and Wetzel puts it this way, in order for human freedom to remain real, quote, weakness of the will, failures in deliberation, stubbornness, or sheer force of will would remain permanent possibilities for human agents to lay aside the best laid plans of the Almighty God, end quote. And that's him explaining what he takes to be Augustine's view, okay? So in terms of how this plays out in a reading of Augustine, Wetzel concludes that, quote, Augustine is notoriously vague about the nature of the necessity involved in unredeemed bondage to sin, end quote. So this ambiguity works to Augustine's advantage um, politically in the sense that he can critique um, Manichaeans and Pelagians simultaneously while hiding all the conflicting elements of those criticisms behind the veils of ambiguity and divine incomprehensibility. So, for example, you know, according to Wetzel, Augustine's own soteriology becomes unbalanced in that, and I'm going to read an another Wetzel quote here. So, so uh, for, for Wetzel, Augustine's own soteriology becomes unbalanced in that, quote, Sinners are culpable for their own moral failings, even while saints are not commendable for their moral successes, end quote. 
So ultimately, so Wessel says that's an inconsistency. Okay, so ultimately, in taking aim at both the Manichaeans and the Pelagians simultaneously, Augustine's theology endeavored to prove too much. So tangling his theodicy with his soteriology, Augustine cut off the circulation of coherence to both. Okay, so therefore, both of the authors who undertake to construct a unitary reading of Augustine, Stump and Wetzel, on divine providence and human freedom, conclude that Augustine cannot be trusted with himself to supply a unitary reading. So in order to translate this debate into the task of defining Calvinism, let's say, and to conclude this reading of Augustine, we turn to a debate between two scholars, William Rowe and Anne Pang. So Rowe argues that Augustine's Augustine merely claims to believe in the freedom of the will for the sake of claiming that humans bear moral responsibility. And yet, when speaking of problems in theodicy raised by theological determinism, which some read as fatalism, he is not sufficiently loyal to his original doctrine of freedom to justify his recruitment of the free will theodicy. So, so Augustine sort of essentially becomes a determinist in Rowe's reading, and yet maintains his free will argument of theodicy even in, in his retractions without sort of explicating or dealing with the, the obvious uh, philosophical philosophical problems or intentions and even contradictions which occur uh, when when you become a maximalist providentialist or when you become when you come to believe in a version of meticulous sovereignty that that uh, a meticulous sovereignty and uh, a, a sort of again anachronistically a Calvinistic soteriology right which contradicts your earlier writings on libertarian free will which you utilize to write against the manichaean theodicy okay so that's rose reading pang contends that augustine is sufficiently loyal to his doctrine of freedom but it requires nuance to understand how and 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 uh she argues that he's loyal to his original doctrine of freedom since he distinguishes between what she calls three three sorts of acts of the will which is the power to will simpliciter, which is basically the basic, uh, the potency of the will, the capacity for free choice, the power to will X, which is I can have the power to eat a loaf of bread in front of me, uh, or the power to, again, fly out the window like Superman. I don't have the same power with reference to each of those things. So the power to will simpliciter, which each human has in principle, the power to will X, which is dependent on whatever X is. And then three is the power to achieve what one wills or to manifest some reality in the world, right? So she distinguishes between those three kinds of wills. And she argues that the necessity of God's action in salvation, which is the notion that Augustine is trying to defend later in life, does not compromise the power to will simpliciter. So, so, so Pang would argue that for Augustine, uh, God, a man's trying to will his own salvation uh, is like a man trying to fly out the window like Superman and succeed and be Superman. He simply doesn't have that power. That doesn't negate his power to will simpliciter, which exists for each man. And she says she can maintain, but he can maintain both of those things. But Roe contends that the problem with making that distinction is that that doesn't solve the basic theological, uh, the, 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 the contradicting theological implications of of the sophisticated systems on which 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 Augustine elaborates out of each of these notions of the will, right? So again, you still have the problem of that sliding scale. You still have the problem of, okay, but ultimately, if man is not, you know, if man doesn't have the power to save himself, well, then that means there's some degree of evil in the world for which God is responsible, and we still have to accommodate for that in a way that appeals to a doctrine of free will, which contradicts this notion of liberty, which we have uh, operating in a sort of more reformed soteriology, and on and on the circle goes, is that there, there are these mutually competing, and, and, and at least on the surface, and even after deep reflection, competing and, and conflicting doctrines of will and theodicy and soteriology that never quite fit into the same jigsaw puzzle for Augustine, right? And Roe and Pang are trying to solve that same problem while at the same time give a reading of Augustine, which accounts for what he actually writes. So Pang's contention, let me just go back to that, does seem to work, this distinction between in Augustine between the power to will simpliciter and the power to X, X being in one X, X prime, you know, being a... Uh, 
you know, at, let's say X being the power to save oneself and X prime being the the power to eat a loaf of bread in front of you, right? So, so Pang's contention seems to work. But regardless, okay, how does this have import for the term Calvinism? Well, their particular disagreement, Roe and Augustine and Wetzel and, and, and Stump, okay, their disagreements furnish the present task with three options for the presenting thesis of whether Calvin was original, and we're going to get into Calvin in a second. First, if Roe is correct, then Augustine holds that humans have libertarian freedom sufficient to contradict Calvin's determinism, which is, or, or, or uh, sufficient to contradict Augustine's own determinism, rather. So, the first reading is that if Roe is correct, Augustine holds that human beings have libertarian freedom, w even in his later life, which contradicts his actual determinism. And that is a theological anthropology and a doctrine of providence, which Calvin presumably, well, most definitely rejects. Number two, if Pang is correct, then Augustine's determinism is soft enough to preserve the libertarian power to will simpliciter, which is actually a doctrine of God that Calvin presumably rejects, which we're going to get to in a second, right? And then three, if both Roe and Pang are incorrect, and let's say Augustine really is consistent and right somehow in a way that no Augustinian scholar has been able to reconstruct in the history of Augustinian studies, if both Roe and Pang are incorrect, then there is at least sufficient ambiguity in Augustine's writings to debate to what degree he was a libertarian. That debate could not occur about Calvin's writings, which substantiates to some degree, at least provisionally, novelty in Calvin's articulation of providence and human freedom, which justifies the use of the term Calvinism to refer to a theology based on John Calvin. He wasn't just Augustine, you know, 1.1. He wasn't even Augustine 2.0. He was Calvin 1.0. And that's something very new and fresh. And, and, and had, I mean, we're not even going to get into his Trinitarian theology, but, but, but that, that is for Calvin something so teriologically, and even with regard to the doctrine of predestination, especially, something so original to Calvin that Augustine never achieved, uh, a consistency that never really had, uh, uh, that never really bore fruit in, in, in Augustine or never really came to fruition in Augustine. Now, moving on to Calvin's views on divine providence and human freedom. So the question still remains, right? Did John Calvin, uh, you know, really teach uh, such a doctrine of divine providence and human depravity so as to conflict with Augustine and therefore be deigned sufficiently original to use the moniker Calvinism in the modern day. So, regarding God's providence, let's just start with Calvin's own words, shall we? Calvin puts it this way, quote, God exercises such care over the world of which he is the creator that nothing happens except through his certain and unchangeable decree. Do I need to read that again? Nothing happens except through his certain and unchangeable decree, end quote. So, although Calvin does seek to insist, so Calvin has to wrestle with the same theodicy problem is gonna, and is going to run into the same. He's going to be compelled to make, he's going to be compelled to use language similar to Augustine because he was pushing in a, in a, in a, in a direction that is so formally similar to Manichaeism that he's going to resort to, and he's going to sort of play with some of the same inconsistencies that Augustine plays with, okay? And again, don't read me as critiquing Calvin, I'm not, I'm just saying he has to solve the same problem that Augustine never really solved, and so he's have to, going to have to resort to some similar strategies here, whether or not they work is going to sound very similar to whether or not Augustine's work, that, those conversations are going to sound very similar, okay? So, so although Calvin insists that God is not the author of evils, he says, this is, this is what Calvin does say, right? So God was like, no, 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 God, God is, it, evil doesn't emanate from a divine principle per se, but he says this, quote, again, this is Calvin, when, therefore, adulteries and murders and plunders are committed, God applies, as it were, a bridle to all those things, and how much soever the most wicked may indulge themselves in their vices, he still rules them. <laughs> I just have to read that again, man, for all the Calvinists who are like, man, divine permission, man. Let me just, let me just read that again. And how much soever the most wicked may indulge themselves in their vices, he still rules them. <laughs> 
It's an active verb. End quote. So, so John Leith, who's uh, who's com- uh, commenting on on Calvin here, he he comments on this particular passage in Calvin. He says, "Quote: Calvin was not satisfied to state that prod- that providence comprehends the whole of creation. He was specifically concerned with the many ways in which it covers the whole of human existence. On the natural level, what we call the order of nature is really the activity of God." Likewise, all spiritual beings are embraced in the activity of God. Even the devil can do nothing apart from the will of God. The wicked fulfill the purposes of God as well as the godly. Thus, all moral beings are enclosed in the net of divine providence. End quote. Oh! Ha <laughs> ha! Come on, man. Can it get any stronger than this? It can, actually. So... Yet, so so is it possible for humans to have free will in any sense if all things are enclosed in the net of divine providence for Calvin? Um, for Calvin, the, for Calvin, in his mind, there is, okay? But in a sense which one does not really find in Augustine, okay? Going back to this Michael Allen claim that, well, there's nothing really new in Calvin. Yeah, I think we've sort of moved past that at this point, right? So, so does Calvin believe in a doctrine of free will? which allows us to speak about human choice in, in a way that's not directly and straightforwardly collapse into the causality of determinism. Is that, does that exist in Calvin? Yes. But by free will, Calvin means merely, and that, let me put this in his own words. Okay, so by free will, Calvin means merely that, quote, both in doing and abstaining, we seem to act from free choice, okay? So that's Calvin saying that. Both in doing and abstaining, we seem to act from free choice. And therefore, if we do good when we please, we can also refrain from doing it. If we commit evil, we can also shun the commission of it, end quote, okay? So he also admits a threefold distinction, okay? So Calvin's trying to make a threefold distinction as well. So Calvin's actually nuancing himself in ways that Augustine never did. Okay, and and Augustine makes so Calvin makes this distinction a freedom from necessity, which 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 Pang called uh, the freedom um, liberty simpliciter, right? Uh, freedom from necessity, freedom from sin, and then the freedom from misery, and that the first kind from and that of, of the first kind of freedom, which is the freedom of necessity or freedom simpliciter. He Calvin says, quote, man cannot possibly be deprived of that freedom, end quote, okay? So Calvin actually explicitly makes Peng's argument about his own theology. So he's advancing nuance in a way that Augustine never did. He's saying, freedom simpliciter, yes. That I believe in that, okay? So Calvin nearly sounds as if he's, he's conceding libertarian will here, but he immediately qualifies his statement. He almost sounds as if he's conceding libertarian will here. And again, if you concede will simpliciter, that is libertarian will. It's counterfactual will. It's it's a decision. It's a choice. It's capacity to choose, which is not ultimately metaphysically determined by the divine decree. He almost sounds like he's saying that here. And that is that is libertarian will. And that is what is necessary to make the free will theodicy defense. Okay. But then Calvin says this. Uh, he says, quote, I willingly admit this distinction, except insofar as it confounds necessity with compulsion, end quote. Oh, so close. So close, Calvin. So Calvin continues, quote, in this, so let me just say, he says, I willingly admit this distinction, that is between the freedom from necessity and the freedom, uh, the freedom of necessity and the, sorry, it's from the freedom from necessity and the freedom from sin, okay? He says, I willingly admit this distinction except insofar as it confounds necessity with compulsion. So Calvin still wants to say a a, a will can still be determined. So he wants to say, oh, I I make a distinction between freedom simpliciter and a a will simpliciter and will to X, as Pang puts it, or a freedom from necessity and a freedom from sin, as Calvin puts it. He says, I willingly admit this distinction except insofar as it confounds necessity with compulsion, which means well, even liberty simpliciter, or even a will simpliciter, or even freedom from necessity can be determined by necessity and still be free. It's like, wait, now we're indulging in double talk, Calvin. Now we are indulging in double talk. So he summarily explains, quote, in this way, then, man is said to have free will, not because he has a free choice of good and evil, but because he acts voluntarily and not by compulsion, end quote. 
Oh, man. Okay. Okay. So here, Calvin departs from Augustine insofar as even later Augustine, even later Augustine would say that man has free will because he has free choice. Calvin is saying here, no. Nope. This is what Calvin is saying. Humans do not have free will, which he calls liberi arbitri. Okay. L human beings do not have free will on the basis of freedom that they have, duh, which is the liberam, not because they have liberam by which one can elect to choose. So, so human, a human being does not have free will, liberi arbitri, because he has liberam, but because he has a will, voluntate. So, which is to say that man does not have free will because he has freedom, but because he has a will. So to say that free will is free, not because it is free in any sense, but because it is a will, is a tautological or self-referential or, 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 or redundant way of precluding a libertarian quality to the will, of saying, well, we still want all the moral responsibility stuff, we just don't want to acknowledge that human beings have free will because we don't want to detract from divine, the, our doctrine of total divine control over everything. And these two doctrines, a divine sovereignty that extends to every particulate in the universe, including human choice, and in including every human choice, and the rejection of libertarian qualities of the human will. These compose two sides of the same coin of meticulous providence for Calvin. And to either of these doctrines, which is to, 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 to reject either of these doctrines, or one of these doctrines, is to reject the other which Calvin says, quote, to reject either of these doctrines, the total exhaustive divine sovereignty or total exhaustive human depravity, which negates the will and total and total human inability because of divine control. He said, Calvin says to reject any of these doctrines is, quote, nothing is more diabolical than this delirious piety, end quote, which is to say the, the, the rejection of these doctrines. So, in comparing Augustine and Calvin for the sake of establishing Calvin's originality, it will be helpful to note a distinction that the neo-Calvinist Abraham Kuyper makes between the election in the realm of grace and election in the realm of nature. So we might retool this distinction between election in the realm of grace and election in the realm of nature. We might retool this distinction to be the distinction between metaphysics and soteriology. Okay, so this distinction allows a general path along which one may understand the continuities and discontinuities between Augustine and Calvin. So while Augustine certainly spoke quite a bit about metaphysics and Calvin quite a bit about soteriology, the baseline rationale that each used to format their doctrines of divine providence were fundamentally reduced to these two principles. Calvin was talking about, when Calvin was talking about human will and divine will, and that relations between. For him, it really, of course it was about salvation and of course it was about the gospel, but his fundamental rationale, the architecture of his soteriology was rooted and construed in nature and in metaphysics. Whereas for Augustine, it was all about grace and soteriology and the operating soteric principles by, by which God, or under which God uh, applied and appropriated the gospel and salvation to humans. Okay. So for Calvin, it was really all about the metaphysics. And for Augustine, it was really all about salvation, the mechanics of metaphysics versus the mechanics of salvation, Calvin versus Augustine. Okay. So again, of course, Calvin made much of soteriology, blah, blah, blah. And of course, Augustine made much of metaphysics. But the fundamental rationales or the fundamental principles or the architecture of each system was reducible to these two distinct and separate principles for Calvin and for Augustine. But Augustine never pushes his doctrine of providence or really, really it's not even a doctrine of providence. It's a doctrine of providential grace. It's a providentialist view of, of the application of grace and sin. Right? Augustine never pushes his doctrine of providence with such philosophical rigor so as to reach a doctrine of providence so expansive and meticulous as Calvin's. Okay, For Augustine, impover impoverishment of a will is impoverishment due to sin. And for Augustine, I don't think he would ever really have any problem with saying that man before the fall had libertarian free will. Whereas for Calvin, 
That could not be the case, okay? So for Augustine, God's sovereignty was always a matter of his sovereign grace. And the weakness of the human will was always a matter of his unchangeable moral position with God left to himself because of the fall. Calvin affirmed both the sovereign grace of God and the moral incapacitation of human will, but bracketed them merismically between an inescapable determinism from the divine will, which would be operating whether human beings fell or not, and in the human will that served as a metaphysical substratum for these concepts and, and, the, and the, the continuities and discontinuities between Augustine and Calvin, and Calvin can be understood along this stratum, along these parallel, by, by, by distinguishing or disambiguating the strata, which fundamentally explain their theological rationales. Okay? For Calvin, human beings don't have free will because God has total control over the universe. For Augustine, human beings don't have free will with reference to X, with reference to the gospel, because of their moral corruption due to the fall. And we cannot equivocate their doctrines of providence or, 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 sorry, we cannot equate them. And we have to recognize that even when they're using the same terms, many times we, 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 they are equivocating. That, 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 that even when Calvin uses Augustine, sometimes he misuses him because he uses him to substantiate a metaphysical argument or to make soteriological points by, from which he con makes metaphysical conclusions uh, uh, where, where Augustine just simply wouldn't go, where Augustine would not follow Calvin, okay? And these observations allow us to conclude with some evidentiary justification and credibility with several observations that translate directly into this question of whether or not the term Calvinism should be dispensed with because of Calvin's purported unoriginality. So first, the question of whether Calvin added anything to Augustine with regard to theological determinism and human depravity can be solved with a simple observation. Okay, and we've made this point already. There is no debate about whether Calvin believed in libertarian free will on either the moral or the metaphysical or soteriological level. Whereas for Augustine, both are a matter of fierce debate. Even if Augustine would have articulated with the same strength and consistency, meticulous providence and total depravity as Calvin, this then for Augustine, this strength and consistency is so indiscernible that Augustine's lack of clarity serves to showcase Calvin's novel clarity. So even if Augustine did believe everything the same that Calvin did, he simply didn't express it. We don't have any evidence of that, okay? Second, mainstream scholars such as Eleanor Stump and William Rowe even those dissertating on Augustine, are, are torn in different directions about how to read Augustine, not only by the conflicting elements of Augustine's indisputable ambiguity, but also by the very paradox itself of theological determinism and human responsibility. So it's difficult in reading the text of Augustine not to get caught up in the question itself of to what degree does libertarian free will compromise a biblical soteriology and to what degree does a biblical conception of divine providence and even divine determinism compromise or uh, 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 um, an appeal to a free will theodicy. Both of these factors, the textual analysis of Augustine and the philosophical analysis of the, the, the sliding scale of determinism and libertarianism, both of these factors obfuscate Augustinian scholarship to the point that to claim that Calvin's theology is unoriginal because he is Augustinian, while a generosity certainly to Augustine it, it One, it perpetuates a falsehood about the precision that can be found in Augustine's own corpus. And two, it, it delimits Calvin to a softer determinism than he really strove to, to articulate, which was a very strong and unforgiving and merci mercilessly meticulous doctrine of divine providence and human moral corruption. And, we can, and, and to, to, to say that Calvin strove for anything less than that, or a softer side of that, even just for himself, is really to misread Calvin. And, and, to, and, and even if we find that unpalatable, and even if some might say, well, it's not as charitable because it's not as translatable, is really to do an injustice or a, a, an injustice rather to the original intent of Calvin, which was very strong and very unpalatable, especially to our modern analytic theological reformed Catholicity movement, reformed academics, which seemed to really miss this tone and tenor and push within Calvin, which went so far beyond Augustine and goes so far beyond where current reform scholarship even seeks to go.
So yes, we should keep Calvinism as a term.